Uh, it's great to see a, another Australian film is releasing in Australian cinemas in October, a film called The Stranger. And it's my great pleasure to again be talking to the writer-director of The Stranger, Thomas M. Wright. Thomas, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Last time we talked uh, was three years ago when you did uh, Acute Misfortune. And at the end of that uh, interview, you said that you were travelling to the US to appear, because uh, you're also an actor, in uh, a TV show, which I gather turned out to be, is that Bark Skins? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was a series shot in... In um, Canada, and it must have been 2019, right? Like 2019. Okay, okay. And and all and already and already by that point, I was I was working on this film. I didn't really have a break between finishing Acute Misfortune and 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 starting on uh, and starting on this film. Um, when um, when when Acute Misfortune was greenlit, I'd been in conversation with Joel Edgerton about playing one of the parts in Boy Erased, um, his second film. And um, when that film was greenlit, I couldn't be a part of it. And so he said to me, "Well, you know, when when the film's finished, why don't you why don't you send it to me and 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 I'll you know take a look at it for what it's worth." And two years later, I sent him Acute Misfortune when it was when it was just finished, and he. Um, and he he called me back that that same day and and just said I want to find something to work on with you, um, to to either produce or act in or to write together or um, something like that. And that that you know um, from that point you know we forged a, a really strong connection between the two of us. And very quickly, um, this the book on which this is based, Kate Kiriakou's book, The Sting, um, came up, and. Um, you know, my, my first thought was, um, I can't do this. I'm, I'm too afraid of this material. It's um, too too dark, too difficult for me to manage. Um, but as I sat with it, I, I, I began to realise that there was a film there that, that wasn't about violence at all, that whether violence is the reason for the film, it's not the subject of the film. The film is actually about the connections between people. And I think it's a because of that, it's a film actually defined by um, empathy. And so, yeah. It was from three years from that first conversation with um, Joel to the film then premiering in Cannes um, earlier this year, and um, as you said, it's about to it's about to head into cinemas and then and then go um, worldwide on Netflix um, all all over the world. So yeah, it's it's tremendous to get a to get a life like that for an Australian film. Oh, it definitely is, and, and congratulations on all of that. Um, now, uh, apart from the, the novel that you mentioned, um, The Stranger is based on, uh, sort of based uh, on a true story of the uh, kidnapping of a, of a young boy um, or a teenage boy uh, going back about 20 years or so. Uh, what was the inspiration then behind, apart from the novel, you writing this screenplay and then directing this film? Yeah, so to be to be clear, the book that it's based on isn't actually a novel. It's a it's a work of kind of investigative um, journalism written by Kate Kiriak, who was the chief crime reporter for the the Courier Mail in in Queensland, and she'd been a court reporter during that particular case. And that book is a factual piece of reportage about that case and the conviction of the eventual conviction of that individual. Um, but it also expands outward to to figure you know um centralizing that that victim and their family and also other suspects in that case and very quickly when i when i read this material i felt that there was a story that really demanded to be told um in there but i felt um a very strong moral position early on that i had no right to depict that victim, certainly not to depict any violence whatsoever, but also a choice not to depict the family or those closest to that person. But I wanted to tell a story about these individuals who had never met that victim, um, who didn't know them, but who devoted years of their life and their mental and physical health to resolving this, this case on behalf of those, on behalf of those strangers. Um, 
I, I, as I said, I was really afraid of it and I was afraid of it on a number of levels because I don't think there's any Australian film um, like it. There are certainly Australian films that deal with violence and that deal with certainly in someone like Justin Kurzel's body of work, you know, um, a violence that is kind of almost unnameable um, and a part of human nature that that is, is um, really difficult to confront Um but I wanted to make a film that took place in the wake of that violence and that was about an attempt to make meaning when violence, when that violence threatened to render things meaningless and to take a broader um, social perspective um, about that also um, and about the function of our society, the, the function of our, our justice system to, to attempt to make meaning from... Um, chaos and using story to do that too, using a story to to entrap a person um, and not to get too 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 deep about it necessarily. But I, but, you know, what human beings do is to tell stories. Our, um, you know, we, we 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 create legal fictions to give a sense of order to a, a situation that's essentially chaotic, which is a group of living creatures floating, you know, spinning meaninglessly on a, on a ball in the, in, in the, in the dark. Um, and, and um, we, we, we use these stories to, to, to give our lives a sense of order and perspective. Um, and, and, and that becomes a subject to the film. Yeah. Well, it, it is quite an incredible story. And uh, uh, this whole police procedural, the, uh, the undercover, uh, uh, notion that's in the storyline, etc., is is quite incredible, and uh, I, I like the way you shot it as well. It it looks mm. uh, it, it looks so gritty in many respects, but it gives you that feel of uh, this difficulty that this uh, case was presenting. Um, and so, uh, and I think Sam Chiplin, I think, was the cinematographer. So uh, yes, I want to commend Sam you on Chiplin. The film. Yeah, shot the film. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, look, that was something Sam and I, I mean, we had a we had a lengthy preparation period in this film and a period of preparation that was actually lengthened by a COVID interruption as well. Um, so Sam had over a year to prepare for the film. It was a very lengthy pre-production period and we shot the film on um, 1970s Panavision C-series um, lenses, um, which are the lenses used by Gordon Willis, um, you know, and... And in terms of the photography, we thought very much, obviously, darkness is used a lot um, in the film. And, you know, Gordon Willis being known as the Prince of Darkness, we looked at, we certainly looked at a lot of Gordon Willis's work. We looked at a lot of Conrad Hall's work. Um, and we, we wanted to use, we wanted to use darkness in empty space in a way that really directed your eye because there's so much information in the film. You really needed a visual language that was uncluttered and quite um, pure, but also that had a strong texture, gave you a strong sense of place. And everything was about placing you into that relationship and into those situations. Um, so, you know, they were the lenses used on films like There Will Be Blood. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and, um, you know, the film is shot digitally on the Arri Alexa, the 35mm negative size um, original Alexa Mini. Um, yeah, but a lot of that comes down to the locations too. That's also shooting in those badlands sort of north of north of Adelaide um, that give that film its really um, raw, uh, raw feel. And it was shot at the height of um, summer as well. So um, hot and dry conditions. Um. Well, well done on that because the film looks looks uh, terrific, and I have to commend you. Apart from Joel Edgerton on the casting, Sean Harris uh, is just uh, incredible in this film. Yeah, I think both Sean and Joel really went someplace else um, with this film. Um, I was certainly aware watching it in person and behind the monitor while we were shooting the film that. Um, something um, something was really, something authentic was taking place between them. And I watched those two people really change on a kind of molecular level, um, really disappear into those parts. It was, it was not a, um, it was a difficult shoot. Um, and the film asked a lot 
of those two in particular, but also of Jada Alberts, who plays Detective Rylet. Um, and I couldn't be more thankful to those actors. They um, they went so deep and they allowed me to push and push um, also um, and to find a barometer of performance that felt felt right for the for the thing but uh, for the film but but you know when Joel and I talked very early on two years before the film was made about the 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 individual you would least want to be trapped in a car with and having their intelligence focused on you and their capacity for interrogation turned on you and to have to mirror Sean Harris's name came up um yeah, right immediately um and i really think his work just speaks for itself i think it's it's absolutely an extraordinary performance but i feel the same way about joel and i feel the same way about jada steve mazarkas um alan dukes who plays john the fiction head of the of the criminal organization in the film um and i think there is something to the tune of 50 50 something speaking parts in the film so it was a complex film to cast yeah yeah I also recognised you and Leslie, of course, and Annie Finster, etc. So you've really yes, that's right. A good a good group yeah. of actors there. <laughs> mm. Yeah, well done on that. Um, and I also must commend you on the the sound design and also the music, music by uh, Oliver Coates, I think, um, because that's right. The the sound and feel of the film, apart from the visuals, uh, is what uh, adds to the tension uh, and atmosphere of your film. I feel like, you know, I, I, I don't want to throw him off the deep end and I don't know him personally and I don't feel innately critical toward him whatsoever, but I saw an interview with Richard Flanagan at MIFF this year where he was talking about directing his film The Sound of One Hand Clapping in the late 80s and he said he realised that um, that novels are a cosmos where, where films are effectively short stories with decoration or addition. Um, I, I don't agree with Richard on that. I think films are cosmoses. I just think not in the same way that novels are. Uh, you know, novels are often cosmoses of of, of um, causality and associations and in a in a life. Um, but film has to use all of the elements at its disposal, um, and they have to accumulate to mean something unique to that film and to fit you uniquely to that subject that they're dealing with that's fundamentally what i'm addressing as a director is the question of form and content you have the story which is traveling along a horizontal plane that's the content of the story that you're telling but the form is is the vertical element of that it's it's and that may be the the timeless quality of the conversation that you're having, the more universal things that should come from the specificity of the film, but also the sound design, the 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 the, the auditory language that you have around the film and, and what the meaning of those elements are. I couldn't be more proud of the sound design of this film. And, and you know, we slaved over that sound design, myself and Andy Wright, who is the sound designer, who's an Oscar-winning sound designer, who he won an Oscar for Hacksaw Ridge um, several years ago. Um, but we wanted to put you into those environments in a really visceral and physical way and to make this film as tactile and deeply felt um, as, as uh, we could. Um, and there are a couple of very clear psychological choices about how we did that, things that are thematically reinforced and repeated over and over through that um, film. But the intention is just to draw you, to draw you in, deeper and to give people a really unique um, experience with this film. Um, um, that, that, that's fundamentally what we, what we wanted is for it to, to be understanding of its heritage in, in cinema um, and the lineage of Australian cinema and film dealing with violence, but to give you a unique experience of that, um, uh, something that's compelled by this material that we were dealing with. Oh, definitely, and that tension is there um, pretty much throughout the film. And it's also exemplified by Joel Edgerton's character who, uh, uh, with his revelation about his uh, being an undercover police officer, I don't think that, that's too much of a spoiler. But his No, son, I don't think it is. Yeah. Yeah. And also his and son his, and, there, yeah. And his son is my son. That's my real son. Ah. Um, his son 
son in the film is played by my little boy Cormac, who was um, uh. who was eight years old at the time. Um, and I felt like in determining how I was going to deal with material like this and material that's about our deepest fears, about the people that we care about, um, and the fact of human violence in the world, um, that you needed that you needed that counterpoint in the film, and and on a deeper level than a kind of structural way of thinking about it, it was really about uh, um, how 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 close I was really willing to go to that flame um, personally as well, um, and to consider what the film is is really dealing with. And yeah, Joel Joel is in an incredibly complex position. He's he's effectively being torn apart through this film and being asked to transform into something that he can't stand and to deepen a relationship which we know is entirely based on lies and to take him into a place where his psychological defences begin to um, fall apart. Um, fundamentally, you know, one of the main things that drew me to this material was that idea of what is it to... To, for those people out there who who have to live with that darkness day in day out and who have to go closer when the rest of us have the have the luxury of being able to walk away from it um, whether that's something they're personally impelled toward or whether it's necessitated by their work um, but um, yeah again congratulations that works so well in thank the you film. thank you yeah. so much. It, it is very impressive. So Would I be right in saying originally the film was titled The Unknown Man? That's right. That's right. Uh huh. Well, the film the film was originally the film I originally wanted to fill, call the film The Stranger, um, but we were unable to because there was another film that was going through um, Screen Australia for financing at the same time as us, which had the title The Stranger. Uh, so the film briefly became the unknown man for the period of time that it was being made, and then as that as that other project was never completed, we we were able to return to the the ideal title, which was the stranger. Sure. Now, of course, uh, we should mention that the stranger premiered at uh, or played at uh, the Melbourne International Film Festival and also at Cannes. And you mentioned that. That's right. um, uh, it's it's going to uh, apart from uh, being released in October in Australian cinemas, it's then going to Netflix. But I gather it would have more international film currency, cinema currency. Well, well the the film is having international cinema premieres world right now. Right now, it's playing in Sitges in Spain. It's also playing in London. It's having a cinema release right now in Belgium and Luxembourg. Ah. But I think it's a it's a um, a question that faces all filmmakers now. And when Martin Scorsese and Andrew Dominic and Jane Campion are making films for Netflix, I, I, I think it's it's evidence that they have a really meaningful position in the market. And when, as an independent Australian filmmaker, your film can go out to 224 million people. Um, that's not something to to turn away from. And look, I I would encourage anybody who's able to to get out and see this film in cinemas. It's a truly cinematic experience. Um, I was very proud to see the film premiere at the Salle de Bussy in 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 Cannes, which is a you know 1500 seat cinema with extraordinary picture and sound, and then at IMAX in Melbourne. Um, and I know everybody who's film at IMAX was was bl blown by the production standard of the film and the way it holds up to a canvas that large. But I also think it's going to be a, a really striking experience for those who experience it for the first time in their home, being as it is a film about um, our most private fears crossing over into our personal lives. In a in a really physical, really immediate way. So I think it's going to be. Um, I, I, I'm, look, I'm I'm just encouraged. I'm excited for people to see it, no matter how they see it. But um, but if you can get out to a cinema and see it and see the film in Australian cinemas, then absolutely, please do. Fully endorse that. And just to conclude, uh, Thomas, are you working on another film at the moment? 
I am. I'm working on another couple of films at the moment. And, um, you know, I was very conscious beginning The Stranger that it was, um, it followed a certain through line from my first film, Acute Misfortune. Um, but the the other films that I'm working on are undeniably dark. Everything I work on is is pretty dark. <laughs> I don't know why, but um, they're but they're formally very very different films. So no, I'm I'm really excited about about working on them. Yeah. Well, look forward to those, and certainly I urge uh, everyone to go and see uh, the Stranger in cinemas in October. Um, uh, so it's been a pleasure talking to Thomas M. Wright, the writer-director of The Stranger. Um, thanks so much again uh, for talking with me. Thanks so much, Peter. Really appreciate it. All the best. Bye-bye. Thanks, Peter. All the best, mate.